Good afternoon, members and guests. Uh, welcome to the um, FCC Club Lunch. Um, I'm Andrew Chen. Um, I'm on the professional committee. Um, I'm also, for my day job, I manage recent opportunity for CLP Power in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm your host and moderator here tonight, uh, today, uh, for the Cup Lunch. So to, today's topic is a very highly topical and relevant topic um, on the future of the fiat currency and also geopolitics geopolit with um, chief economist uh, Raymond Young. Um, so I'll talk just a brief introduction. Um, so China and US have established an ecosystem that facilitate what chief economist Raymond Young has called for the factory dollar recycling for years. What he means by this is that when global supply chains are disintegrating and financial decoupling is a natural consequence. Um, while the global markets are questioning the future of the fiat currency, central banks are promoting their own versions of digital tokens. Uh, Raymond believes the core issue here is actually with the payment infrastructure and not necessarily the US dollar versus the Chinese yuan. He finds the implication for global investments are subtle and but significant. In a moment, we will hear from Raymond on his take on the future of fiat um, currency and how it affects the geopolitical relations between US and China, especially with the um, elections coming up in the you know, presidential elections approaching quickly. Um, a bit about Raymond. Um, he's the chief economist of Greater China uh, in his Fed Bank. Um, he's been leading an award-winning team uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. He's covered China research for over 30 years. Uh, he's also an author of the China's Trump card. Um, it's the cryptocurrency and the game-changing role in the Sino-US relations. Um, so this was published in 2020. So he was, a, he was actually the fourth thinker at that point in time, um, when you think about what happened five years ago in cryptocurrency as well. Um, he's a leading voice in a lot of global conference. Um, I speak a lot in accounting conference as well. I met uh, Raymond over the years as well. Raymond has also served on the steering committee on the China Chief Economist Forum. And on behalf of FCC, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Raymond um, to the FCC. Um, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, thanks for this kind introduction. And uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you, this is uh, one of the New York worst seller ever in history. <laughs> and um, you can't buy this book because the publisher decided not to reprint it. And um, so, uh, but I just have uh, two or three copies. Uh, one reserved for my wife, another two reserved for my daughters. Um, <laughs> so, so on, uh, on that note, I actually got this copy. It actually took three and a half weeks. So it's so rare, it's actually very difficult to get. Yeah, the rare, the better. Um, this is how <laughs> we, uh, you know, to decide that uh, either um, decide to come to join today's lunch or decide to sit on the screen in front of the screen because of the stock market in China, right, in the last few days. Um, now, uh, that's my day job at ANZ is a macroeconomist, and uh, so I track most of the, um, the uh, macro development in China, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan as well. Um, and uh, what happened in the last few days can tell you, you know, the uh, financial um, indexes and uh, or even money, you know, is so powerful in the sense that when the People's Bank of China decides to print money uh, with the cutting the reserve requirement ratio or just 20 basis point cut, you know, 0.2 percentage point cut can move the market for a few thousand um, points, you know, in Hang Seng before the onshore markets open. You know, that's a very interesting phenomenon that now grandpa and grand, grand, grandma started to line up and uh, in, especially in sh my colleagues in Shanghai, you know, it's got some uh, family relatives <clears throat> trying to open or reactivate their brokerage account again. And that can tell you, you know, how powerful uh, even the verbal intervention of the Polybora uh, could be. So anyway, that's uh, just a bit of uh, reflection. Do you yeah. want me to uh, yeah, present? So, um, so Raymond will kick off with a presentation, and then I'll do a few moderated questions, and then we'll open up the floor for questions as well. Yeah, yeah. and uh, also another nice thing that you uh, mentioned about me, uh, Andrew, is that uh, you said that I'm an award-winning um, uh, economist, but uh, I, I don't wish, I don't know which award that I ever won. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> I did, you know. The, but uh, the, the future of the fiat currency and geopolitics, uh, it's good to talk about that uh, inside FCC. Now, <laughs> the key message is here um, that I would like to talk. Uh, sometimes I don't want to uh, sit down and to talk. First of all, the font size is too small for a guy who is in mid-50s. Um, secondly, is that I like to explain to you, you know, the uh, original scene, the scene of uh, money is, uh, this is the source of uh, global imbalance. 
And that's the whole thesis I had on uh, factory dollar recycling. Secondly, the best way to address the trade imbalance is to establish a global currency, a political, very neutral, global currency is the only way to solve the global imbalance. Um, blockchain offered a uh, very timely solution to solve the problem through the changing of the payment system that we have been using since Britain Wood in uh, 1944. And the global choice is to um, uh, have an uh, open source um, payment technology, right? Uh, blockchain and now the, uh, everything is talk about open technology like open AI or whatever. Uh, open, openness is the key word. The reason I talk about this the factory dollar uh, recycling is to observe what happened. On the left hand side, you see the chart of US fiscal deficit and the US uh, trade deficit. It's a twin deficit problem. Why? You know, persistently in the last 20 years or 30 years, you know, US been running the twin deficits for a long, long time. But at the same time, on the right hand side, you see another chart with the uh, US trade deficit with China and the China stocking of the US Treasury. Well, we all know about all this, right? And uh, if you are working in the financial sector in central, um, you might have come across this type of um, um, charts before. And it's clearly uh, a phenomenon of the China funding the US trade deficit or current account deficit for years since China opening uh, in late 70s or early 80s. So protectionism, uh, the, the reason I <clears throat> authored this book is because it's, uh, at that time when Donald Trump started uh, the first presidency, I'm not implying that he will have the second one, but I'm just saying that when he first <laughs> started his first presidency um, and uh, have the, uh, started the trade war uh, by lifting the tariff and hopefully can uh, generate more jobs in the US and um, but then uh, my idea was that that's probably just a short-term solution, uh, but not a long-term recipe to adjust the global imbalance. That's pretty clear. Um, because, uh, but the damage has been done. The protectionism has already reshaped the global trade flow. And that's why this, when I mentioned about the cryptocurrency at that time, 2019, when I wrote the book, I got published after COVID. And no one bought this book because all the airports was, were closed in the world, and the publisher Wiley told me, why um, just a few hundred copies were sold because uh, people tend to pick up a book you know, when they're waiting for the flight, right? That's typically the case, but then in 2021, 20, you know, in the last few years, no one bought it. So forget about that, that's a sad story for me. Uh, nothing to do with protectionism. But the left, right-hand side I'd like to point to you is that uh, since 2017, uh, the expressing index that's the U.S. import from China versus U.S. import from the rest of the world. You clearly see the differentiation. You know, the dark blue line is China. The right, light blue line is the rest of the world. So the supply chain has shifted. Uh, I don't need to reiterate this point that many of the so-called, you know, making Chinese goods is now made in Mexico. Or Vietnam, of course, is a long, long time. You know, if an analyst tell you, wow, you see that supply chain realignment is going to Vietnam and Indonesia, I think they... This guy might be new to the industry, it's an outdated. <laughs> it's now Mexico is probably the one. Uh, and the tariff level um, is um, already sky high. Uh, after the election, or coming to next year, I'm not sure you know, whether this right-hand side or left-hand side will also have another jump of the ta average tariff level imposed on Chinese goods. And uh, we had an estimate uh, by uh, my research team, uh, both in Singapore and Hong Kong, you know, on the uh, impact is that the Trump's tariff plan, the universal tariff, not just towards China but to other countries, would affect trade, and the biggest um, loser would be Vietnam and maybe Taiwan because expressed in the trade um, to the U.S. proportional to their original total trade, China was not wasn't that bad. You know, if you look at the bottom of the last three um, row. You got uh, India, Indonesia, and China. Country is big, you got the big domestic demand, so they express in the percentage term. The US value added or the trade of value added to the US is just a small amount you know, of the domestic uh, economy. So, what happened in China now is so bad, the economy has nothing to do with trade, but it's more to do with the domestic downturn of the property market. Um, 
All right, um, I will finish it very soon. Um, <clears throat> the US econo uh, China economic decoupling inflation high for longer. You see these two lines, highly correlated. I could have reversed the scale so that they come together, but it's easy for you to comprehend it. Um, that I uh, show you uh, there has been a decoupling between China and the US in terms of direct bilateral trade. So you saw that the, the rebound from 20 to 24 in um, the yield curve of the US because China has been funding the US trade deficit and the US has, can, can issue US treasury uh, because you've got the biggest buyer. It's one is China, Japan, and the US Fed themselves. It's the biggest buyers of uh, US treasury. So the, in terms of managing the public finance, you got uh, big support from China at the same time in the last 20, 30 years because China joined part of the US economy as part of the supply chain. So the US can manage the inflation from sky high to a very, very low inflation. And the interest rate and the bond yields reflect this. And you see this um, the strong correlation between the two. When imports from China's share continue to rise, the US interest rate continued to drop before the trade war started in 2020 or 2017, technically speaking. Right? It's uh, proven to be the case. You know, when I wrote this book, I was just testing my ideas. But now, after the last four years, it's clearly tell you this is actually happening. And that's why we have the high for longer narrative for the US interest rate scenario. Um, then my idea is, is when, at that time is to perhaps we need to fix this. You need to find the root uh, problem. The issue is the fiat currency because the US can print money forever to fund the current account deficit. This tariff could not solve the problem. Then I was thinking at that time, you know, everybody was talking about Bitcoin. Then I picked up this uh, Nakamoto um, paper on the electronic payment system. Uh, paper. It's downloadable, it's free. Uh, don't have to pay for that. Then have a bit of understanding of what Bitcoin work. Basically, it's a decentralized or distributed tech, um, uh, ledger technology, and uh, you don't have to go through banks. And as long as his idea is as long as we all agree that I own Andrew's money, if half of the people here in this hall, hall um, can validate that I actually own Andrew's for today's lunch, $360. Uh, for this FCC lunch, then, um, then I own him. I don't have to have a bank as a central and a middleman to validate this uh, credit. So that's the whole idea of the payment system through decentralization. So with Bitcoin, then uh, all the bankers will be out of jobs. Um, technically speaking, of course, banks now, um, with the support with central banks, is promoting a central bank digital currency so that you know, the original legacy banking system or the payment system will be preserved. At that time, uh, this is one of the regrets I had in the last few years when I wrote the book. And this is the original copy of the book on the left-hand side. Is the price of Bitcoin was traded at $8,000. And the right-hand side is the chart that I, I copied last um, two days ago from my Bloomberg screen. How much is Bitcoin now? 67 or 62,000 <laughs> compared with 8,000 when I wrote and published this book. This is one of my regrets, why I'm still working for ANZ Bank. <laughs> I shouldn't have worked if I act on what I believed. <laughs> this is the biggest problem. You know, I'm not too faithful enough you know, for my own uh, mindset. But the CBDC is another strange thing that's uh, happened in the last few years after I published this book. I propose, in the book, I propose to establish a global world cryptocurrency by the IMF, which is neutral enough not by individual country, by a, an association uh, with neutral position to issue money that could fix the uh, US persistent uh, trade deficit and current account deficit uh, without the use of tariff. And uh, CBDCs then uh, emerged in the last few years, the central bank digital currency. But it is still a fiat currency, and that China is, uh, is already having this um, ECNY on the, on the right hand side um, two, two years ago. And uh, Hong Kong, you know, you know this, um, last month started to have um, talk more about this e Hong Kong dollar, right? So it's also a kind of central bank digital currency, still part of M0 in money and banking. Um, so I don't think this is a cryptocurrency still using the central bank's balance sheet operated by commercial bank. 
but the payment system will be a lot more simple, making use of the blockchain technology. Now people maybe from a geopolitical angle may also want to talk about, discuss about whether this is a replacement of SWIFT uh, in the future. I tend to avoid this type of um, uh, discussion because in the past, uh, this project, Line Rock project, started way, way earlier uh, than the uh, geopolitical um, changes. Um, then uh, M now they have this name called Ambridge. Um, it's still a consensus uh, payment technology with the uh, four central banks, uh, Hong Kong MA, Bank of UAE, uh, and Bank of Thailand, and the PBOC. Four of them come together, and, um, and the several transactions have already been done, and that's why Hong Kong residents can go to Bangkok and Thailand and Phuket to have FPS. Because HM and Bank of Thailand work closely on that in the last few years, now our FPS can be used in Thailand. I haven't tried that. I'll be going to Vietnam this afternoon, but not Bangkok. You know, try to persuade my wife to go to Bangkok, but then he de she decided to have Da Nang <laughs> this afternoon because it's a long weekend, right? So I uh, take tomorrow's off. Um, not Vietnam, but Thailand. <laughs> anyway, another regret is the last few days that I published this note uh, in, to my clients on uh, 13th of uh, September when everybody was so bearish about China, I uh, called for a stimulus program. It happened a few days later after the mid-autumn festival, the mooncake holiday. Then China started to tell the world that I started to print money. And uh, I am just a writer. I'm just an economist. I don't execute my trade. And that's why I'm broke. And you see that the uh, hand, right hand side, another regret I had was a 30% increase in Hong Kong stocks. <laughs> I have to go back to work, sorry. <laughs> Useful references. Uh, talk to you, important notice don't trust economists. <laughs> right? Again, don't trust economists. <laughs> Memorize all these pages. Okay, thank yes. you. So, thank you, Raymond. Um, so, with great regrets, I'm sure you have two great regrets. Um, we'll, we'll try to uh, work out your regrets and hopefully get some um, insights from you that how we can actually um, navigate some opportunities from um, whatever is happening in the world right now. So um, I'll kick off with uh, some questions. Um, so in terms of um, what do you mean by the US dollar and the Chinese yuan being factory dollar recycling? Maybe I'm making just um, an idea I had was that, that China operated a factory. The original idea is a petrol dollar, right? Some of them, um, some of you might have heard about petrol dollar. That's the basis of the US dollar as a global currency is because they have an agreement with Saudi Arabia back in uh, 1973. Uh, in those days that, uh, the, you know, the, um, uh, Richard Nixon abandoned the gold standard, or technically speaking, it's called gold exchange standard, not just gold standard, but gold exchange standard because US dollar is a substitute for gold. There's a lack of physical gold. So the world um, gives the US a privilege to uh, print money as a form of supplement to the physical gold. But Nixon um, abandoned it. So they really need to find an anchor to support back the value of US dollar. And Saudi Arabia is happy to, to do um, uh, oil trade by uh, using US dollar exclusively. And this exclusiveness, you know, to support the value of the U.S. dollar and stabilize the value afterward. Now, by the same token, this, uh, China is also repeating the same. But of course, in the old days, it's about the Saudi Arabia export of oil and the U.S. needed. And once Saudi Arabia got this or Middle East got it, uh, the money, where do they invest? They also back to the U.S. dollar and uh, trade the U.S. Treasury in New York. And recently, it's more the repo facilities too. Um, now, uh, the same idea applied to China. China rent a, a current account surplus with uh, the U.S. And where do they invest? You know, they can't invest locally because the U.S. dollar proceed. So I have to find a U.S. dollar. Or maybe I can convert it into Euro too. But still, an offshore investment uh, needed. And the investments, um, the risk-free investment, especially for the central bank, is government bond, U.S. Treasury. That's the gold standard. I think this leads on to the um, next question. Um, so what, if, what is the future of the fiat currency? Like, and and what, why do you think the central banks are so concerned? About mm. I start to um, uh, give an idea to my clients uh, uh, that now if the world is not the same as the world five years ago, uh, with the emphasis on national security everywhere, not just China, not just the US, but everywhere in the world, will investors start to think 
that a paper issued by an individual country is still reliable. I think this is also uh, one way to think about the geopolitical uh, impact to the financial market is perhaps a spe either a specific commodity mm. will be uh, more safe, uh, more secure, right? Because, you know, in, uh, at the time of the global chaos, uh, envi chaotic environment, then you rather have something physical on hand. People talk about gold, gold price been rising, uh, but gold is uh, the old days, physical gold, and how do you carry your, go your gold, you know, um, um, you know, physically and um, for the cross-border uh, transactions, not easy. Um, then another one, obviously, is that in the digital world, then think about in the old days, oil is the biggest and the best reserve in the world, because once you've got oil, the oil can back your balance sheet. Just like, in the, in, to some extent, in I work for an Aussie bank right, in Australia, then the biggest reserve, the real reserve, you know, Patrick, correct me if, not, if I'm wrong, I would think for the Aussie dollar is iron ore or coal, natural resources. It's what backs the country's currency, right? So for the Middle East, it's oil. For Australia, it's uh, iron ore or natural resources. For Kiwi, maybe, uh, maybe dairy. The ship, your ship. <laughs> More ship than people, right? More yeah. ship than people. You know, it's, uh, the milk you produce by Fonterra could be a, uh, the reserve for, uh, for the country, for Kiwi currency. So for China, it's the labor. It used to be labor because, uh, you know, the hardworking people uh, making iPhone for the whole world and uh, work for 996, you know. Nine days, uh, anyway, you know, 24 hours and seven days, you know, nonstop. So these are the natural resources China have is the labor market. So, uh, but in the future, once we get to the digital age, what's the most valuable resources? Uh, five years ago, when I uh, was about publish to publish this book, I was in Shanghai in a big conference also, the first uh, time that I came up, some of the discussion I had with other economists, I came up with this idea that maybe data or data, you know, in Aussie terms, <laughs> is the, uh, is the uh, natural resources in the future, is the most valuable resources in the future. The more the, the data you have, the um, more, you know, your, that's what define the wealth of your nation. Mm. It's actually, um, when you talk about petrol dollars, um, and also like linking the resources, because with all the renewables coming up and all the new technology coming up, so, um, so how would this change your view of US dollar being petrol dollars, if that is going to change with renewables, then how is that going to change your view? Yeah, in the, uh, before the trade war or before the current geopolitical uh, tension happened five, six years ago, I think the world was still operating in a very globalized manner. It's a globalization, one world uh, mindset that uh, you don't really need to diversify your portfolio. But now we are running into a very multipolarized system we will be going for, for a very multipolarized system that no single commodity or resources will define the value. Mm -hmm. For some, that might be uh, petrol or, or petroleum. For some, maybe data. For some, might be uh, people. For some, maybe iron ore or coal. So this, uh, I think, uh, in the future, is no single one that could uh, you know, dictate the world. Mm -hmm. but uh, in the past, it's more about in the single world that people, well, give the authority for the U.S. Fed that you can print money because we trust you, you know, as a single authority that care about the welfare of the world. But in the end, of course, the world, the Fed, FOMC, is just a few members looking at the U.S. CPI or PCE inflation to make the interest rate decision. Mm -hmm. Not our interest rate, uh, not our unemployment or inflation not other countries' inflation or unemployment, but just the U.S. inflation or unemployment to make the interest rate effect decision, but affecting the whole world. So in the future, it will be a very multipolarized system that I believe. But you do want to have a very single, uh, a very liquid um, transactional or payment system so that this credibility issue or this credibility, this type of trust um, uh, will still be retained and perhaps uh, blockchain uh, or a payment technology uh, through um, digital platform will be a way to solve this type of problem. Mm. And another question I have, like, well, actually, actually with the U.S. election in mind, um, in, my, in my view is that Trump will be very transactional and then Harris will probably be Biden-like, but then there's the U.S. Congress, which is very anti-China. 
So whatever outcome it happens, it will still be pretty much the same. But then um, my question is to you is that how will this impact the global economy uh, in your view as an economist? Well, it's very difficult to, to um, um, when I was asked by clients, so who, whoever win, um, which side will benefit China more or will be more harmful to China, it's very difficult to answer this question. Uh, but of course, the mainstream view is that Trump will be uh, a very transactional person, that he is willing to come up with a phase two agreement with China, mm -hmm. so that, well, you give me some jobs, I um, can uh, not to impose a tariff to you, so that the agreement that he had with China was phase one, and phase two was about to happen before COVID uh, outbreak. So perhaps, you know, that is from the Chinese perspective, they rather have Trump because everything can be talked. You know, you can discuss uh, with me uh, for whatever exchanges I can have with you. You know, that's probably the, the ideas that some people or one perspective um, from the Chinese uh, friends that I um, spoke to with. Uh, whereas Harris will be probably the BAU uh, and, um, with the current uh, Democrats, um, um, you know, to way of dealing with China. Uh, working with allies, Japan, India, trade, you know, the stock market in Japan is booming and everyone's talking about India. You know, these are probably how it would, um, from the financial market or economic point of view, can foresee to two different type of uh, regime. But overall, of course, they are both uh, very tough on Chinese trade and investment and technology transfer. It's not just about importing from China. It's all about exporting technology to China too. So basically, both will go, still go for this uh, decoupling uh, story. Um, uh, it's just the, the way they express it will be very different. Mm. So the, uh, I'm going to ask one more question before I open up to the floor. Um, another thing you mentioned about is the Apple um, share price being interlinked with the Chinese economy. Um, is this still the case? Um, and is this going to be still the trend? If that's going to trend, we can see some analytical thing that come out, some insights can come out from this. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't had the, the charts here. I should have uh, posted my chart there um, in this pack with uh, the last 15 years that I saw since Apple was born. Um, and the Chinese uh, export and Apple share price that come together. Basically, the R square is 0.9 um, in the last 15 years. So uh, the two lines in my charts comes together. And I started to have that chart in 2012. Uh, four or five years after uh, the first Apple iPhone. When was it? 2007? Yeah, 2007. Yeah, 2007, the five years, and I noticed this cycle that comes together. But then in the last 12 years, you know, they <laughs> still be the same. So I was very amazed. Um, so the best way for me to look at China export, to forecast the China export, you know, I have to submit my forecast to Bloomberg every month, uh, is to look at Apple share price. And I don't know, you know, sometimes I also need to do my own survey. How? That's the reason why I speak in a conference or a seminar like this, because I can do an immediate survey of our audience. Who is going to buy iPhone 16 or who have already bought iPhone 16? Can you share one, two, three? Out of how many of us? Oh no, <laughs> Apple share price should be dropping. <laughs> then Chinese export will be negative. <laughs> No, that's, that's just kidding. But uh, I don't know. Uh, first of all, I, how much did you spend on iPhone? You don't have to tell me, but I'm just asking. Twelve thousand. Yeah, Pro Max. Well, that's the best, best camera. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's part of the qualitative survey too. You know, uh, have to ask our audience. You know, where where they put their money. And uh, whether they're buying an iPhone, then to help me to forecast September's, you know, Chinese export, which seems to be a downturn. <laughs> so because of the competition to, you know, before, you don't have Huawei. And now onshore, for patriotic reason, they all buy Huawei. Uh, used to be Samsung as a competitor, but not anymore. Yeah. So with that in mind, I'm going to open up the floor first. Um, any first takers, questions? Two, two um, trends there, you theorize two trends. 
the end of fiat currency or perhaps a shrinking of fiat currency on the one hand and then new international payment systems on the other hand, blockchain, etc. Yeah. Can you expand a bit on the link between those two trends? What do you think they are self-reinforcing or what, what do you see as the link there? Uh, technically speaking, they could be separate. They are two different issues. Yeah. You could have a combination of four <laughs> two by two matrix that you could run still the US fiat currency or even Chinese fiat currency, the traditional central bank system. Uh, and that's the reason why I said that CBDC is still a fiat currency because that part of the central bank's balance sheet, they offer, they issue, they write their own paper. And, uh, but the payment system can be different. You can either go for traditional payment system through banks or, um, or traditional central banks commercial banks, you know, architecture, <laughs> or you can go for a blockchain so you can bypass bank, and that's exactly what happened now with this Enbridge, is the wholesale CBDC, which means that the transaction should be between with the operator as a HKMA and Bank of Thailand. They operate this platform and commercial bank can deal with each other directly without going through SWIFT. You used to be using the messaging system. SWIFT is a messaging system is not actually a, uh, a payment platform, but for correspondent banks, you send the money to your home country. Um, that may not, not all banks can do that for you. Some banks need to deal with their correspondent banks to another correspondent banks so that they can do the cross-border transaction. But that's transaction, that messaging, that you go to HSBC or any counter, um, and then uh, we don't do retail bank, that's why I don't mention ANZ. Then you can go to the counter and say, why are you sending money for what? And the message, that's the message that you need to write on your wire, right? And uh, that's the uh, payment system. So technically speaking, uh, you could have a fiat currency with blockchain and you could have a, what you don't have is the, I believe is this digital currency, um, is the cryptocurrency, uh, using SWIFT. This is probably the only missing piece of the combination of four. Because once you want to have a completely uh, independent currency from central bank, which is not fiat currency, right? From the currency perspective, one is fiat currency by central bank, then that just depends on the central bank discipline. The Fed continue to print money, and China, until two weeks ago, still keeping the pocket tight. You know, the PBOC did not want to print money. So the balance sheets stay the same in the last 10 years uh, with the expansion. Um, but that's another issue. So it's about the central bank discipline. But whereas blockchain is not, it's totally passive. You know, cryptocurrency is totally passive. The issuing of that is because of the hash system. If you look at the Nakamoto paper, you read it, is that once you get a transaction, that is that Bitcoin is basically a reward for you to validate all the transactions in the system. So everyone's work for the same thing, and that's the reward to those people who are doing the mining, either in Nina Mongolia or in uh, some other place with cheap ele electricity, with cheap power, is to mine. The mining process is to validate that I own Andrew money, and uh, so you want to validate it, you have to go through all the different nodes and say, oh, eventually you find out that I own him money, $360, and that's the reward for you once you validate this. Okay, so these are the two money issuing system. But the payment system can be traditional banking and blockchain banks, bank direct, or people to people direct too. You don't have to go through banks in a very extreme case. So that's the language. But why I would put two of them together because we are, the legacy now is the fiat currency with the SWIFT system. A very traditional way that has been running this system for more 100 years or more, more I believe. Um, and so if we don't want to jump to, from non-fiat currency to blockchain, that's a quantum jump. Um, and uh, so the central banks now started to have a compromise. So let me develop CBDC so that that can be a compromise. I retain the banking legacy. At the same time, I am able to adopt blockchain technology. Am I clear enough? Um, or maybe I'm not clear. Actually, I'm not an expert in this. I'm just an economist. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, um, question in the back. 
Hi, thanks. Um, quick comment on that and then a question afterwards. My comment is I am actually a technologist and I think... Oh, good. Yeah. I think uh, blockchain has no technical merit whatsoever. It's, uh, it's a terrible technology. <laughs> the one uh, salient feature it has is permissionlessness, but that is purchased at enormous cost. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, blockchain technologies are about a million to a billion times less efficient than an equivalent distributed permission system would be. So uh, Bitcoin at the moment uses about 1% of the world's electricity for seven transactions per second. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really terrible. Now, what permissionlessness enables, as you highlighted, is decentralization. But what is that good for? I think it's good basically for the evasion of rules and regulations. Yeah, so in my view, blockchain is uh, law-breaking as a service, masquerading as technological innovation. Um, now to my question, if central banks are very reluctant to issue central bank money to retail consumers or, or any non-bank entities really. If we introduced, if, if there were CBDCs, blockchain or any other technology, wouldn't that sort of force or necessitate a switch from our current fractional banking system to narrow banking plus then, you know, we'd have to replace all the credit to narrow banking plus private credit. Uh, and would that be a good thing? Would that work? I think that's a very interesting idea. I think it's possible. You know, that could be a spectrum of different architecture. Uh, either you want a total reform of the uh, going to the decentralized payment system without banks as an intermediary. The whole point of banks, you know, banks exist because you know that's a um, a hub to exchange trust and credit. And the credit means that whether you're a credible person or whether you um, through banks assessment that uh, whether I'm you know, I have the trust um, by, from Andrew um, that I will show up today or not. You know, that's, the, that's why banks exist. But you could have a very simplified banking system to have some decentralized way. I see that now the Hong Kong dollar is probably one way that the FPS or the e-wallet could be the way or the Chinese one, uh, the e renminbi is that uh, even without Wi-Fi or network connection, I can give the money to you him, or you can give the money to me uh, by speaking for you today, and uh, by the e-wallet. So without going through banks, that's a personal exchange. I think that at the retail side, that I believe the world is, uh, or central banks, regulators are willing to go for that route. And that's why the first application between Thailand and Hong Kong is for tourists. And uh, I guess that's the easiest. Or even the cross-border from Chinese tourists coming to Hong Kong and use this type of technology for e RMB is also for small value transaction. But of the wholesale, big value, institutional transaction for portfolio uh, investor, that's probably uh, a very conservative, you know, I think from central banks or financial regulation point of view, uh, got the, all this. You mentioned a very good point about in terms of regulations, that's a very interesting angle. Um, KYC and all this, you know, are the major, or AML, are all the issues that the uh, crypto could not address. And um, you mentioned about the electricity consumption. I believe, you know, that's a very original blockchain, uh, Bitcoin um, drawbacks from, from this very original basic one, but then uh, Ether or, um, smart contract, you know, there are many other uh, different type of enhanced uh, technology that can save power. Uh, don't really need to have the mining again, you know, for all the single transaction. But uh, as far as I know, I read the paper, you know, by Corda. Uh, that's the back, that's help uh, HMA for this permissionary uh, technology. I think that's uh, probably more power saving and do not really need to have um, a across the board validation, but a small group of people or a small group of institution can validate that through a private network so that this private network with the operator as Bank of Thailand and HKMA can act as an operator and also a regulator to avoid uh, to deal with AML issue. That's, that's my understanding so far. Um, but I'm not a tech guy. Thanks, thanks for your <laughs> uh, sharing here too. Yeah. Any 
Any other questions? On the floor? Oh, yep, the corner. Just pursuant to this whole idea of trust in the Esperanto of transactions, uh, you've been talking about individual to individual, but you, I think you mentioned that an institution that might bring order to this might be an overseer, might bring uh, scrutiny as the IMF, if I heard you correctly. Really? Um, isn't that requiring a major transformation of what the IMF actually does and could do? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course, at, at that point in time, that either, if you think about supranationals, um, in managing the financial system, it's either BIS or IMF or not the World Bank, you know, World Bank is more for the development purpose. The BIS maybe, and they are also the most active one pushing for the CBDC too, because of the innovation hub. Basically in Hong Kong too, very interesting. And uh, for this Enbridge project. So I think uh, I just pick IMF, you know, by random you could, <laughs> you could see that that time that the more realistic one is that all the countries, most countries have their share and equities investment in for IMF operation. Now, of course, that IMF is still the Washington DC based <laughs> organization and uh, different countries have their different type of uh, intensity of inference you know, to, um, to the operations and the picking of the staff and pushing for different projects. That's still Definitely, definitely. How do we do? We need the reform of the governance. Do we need to reform about the mandate, or we need to still have a growth of banks um, as opposed to supranational? A growth of banks like the one that is currently operating for the payment system is CLS, uh, which is for netting of all the FX transactions across cross-border transactions. It's a group of big banks. They form a organization called CLS for real-time, uh, real, uh, RTGC, real-time growth settlement. Uh, it's a local domestic one, but then another one across the border is called CLS. It's privately run with the blessing and, um, and the approval from, um, from uh, BI or central banks you know, in the world. So this may also be another way to do that. Now, but of course, that different banks have their own uh, headquarters. So ultimately, they also need to listen to their own financial regulators. For my Aussie bank is APRA. For US bank is you know, the US regulators and for other banks, you know, other different type of regulators. So I, I think that's, that's still the key to address the issue is who runs it. If I propose, if the world is really listening to my proposal to have a global currency. Don't we really need to think about whether this is a fiat currency or not, even if you want to have a global currency. Who, what organization will be the best without the influence of specific country or to balance the influence uh, of different countries um, so that it won't be happening uh, at the same, uh, the current issue I, feel, I see is that the few FOMC member is making the decision for the whole world. That may create a lot of poverty bubble <laughs> around the world too and global imbalance, not to say. So yeah, good point. I don't have a solution. This, this is not an economist problem. This is a political problem. Yep. Any, um, we've got time for one final question. Um, any, yep. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Yep. Fantastic Thanks, presentation. Um, you didn't mention the, BRIC, the possibility of the forming of a BRICS currency, which is currently in discussion. And what would that do to, um, well, where, where would we stand in the future if that happened? because apparently the new BRICS currency would be backed by gold and a basket of other currencies, so it'll be quite a different mix. Mm, it's, um, I think in the end it's just a group of countries that think that they are friendly with each other. It's a kind of, uh, um, it's, it's no different from the current system. You know, the reason most countries still want to use U.S. dollar because you know I I, I feel that you know I, I have no problem using U.S. issue the paper, but for some countries that come together as BRICS country want to issue a paper. My understanding is that uh, they what they are pushing for the two aspects that I've just mentioned. One is they come up with a single currency for apply to these countries. Secondly, is to make use of E 
or digital currency or CBDC to apply this digital or digitization of the fiat currency issued by these four countries or five countries, BRICS, or maybe more, you know, if they uh, successfully, you know, get Saudi Arabia to join the camp as well. Um, so uh, is trying to, and other ini initiative trying to uh, challenge the dominance of US dollar, right? Basically, as simple as that. Uh, it's a political action <laughs> to some extent. Or maybe and, uh, it's also a uh, motivation um, trying to fix the global imbalance problem or to fix the problem that I've just mentioned. It's a few FOMC members dictating the world <laughs> financial system. So this is how, um, if you ask me about you know, what would be the development, I just feel this may be part of the original thinking I had it, or, or the original uh, the outlook I provide is that the world would be moving towards a more multipolarized regime, but how successful that will be, I just feel it's not very easy to have a, just say several countries trying to issue a single currency. Rather, most people will sit, most countries will sit on the sideline and say, hey, US dollar, why not continue to use US dollar? So I just think it's not easy to crack the current system just by a few countries like this. And you think about the bond of the US dollar or before US dollar, the World War II, there was sterling. And uh, the, sometimes probably you need a revolutionary style, a big bang or very chaotic uh, global event to change the monetary regime. You know, if you look at the last two think, uh, dominance currency in the world and just currently we don't see, unless we have World War III or whatever, I don't want to imagine this situation and it's not my idea, especially I wear an ANZ hat too. Um, don't comment on this type of a scenario, but just looking at the last two change in regimes, that was um, an outcome of after a very big global event, not just by several countries coming together. Like Gulf, um, Gulf um, Council um, also thought about having, or, South, or Latin America, Latin also think about that they have their own currency before, but just a group of regional <laughs> player together, at most they could come up with Euro. It's a regional block. Um, then they can come up with Euro, no, not um, Deutsche Mark and um, Frank's French. And so these are, this could be happening, but I don't know. Um, I don't think that would be a immediately feasible. Mm. Okay, now for it, yeah, final, yeah, one, wrap it up. I talk about two. Yeah, I two. So just moving away from the US dollar, moving to another international transaction currency rather than replacing US dollar with something else. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? That would be the third issue. You smart, that's the third issue, not the two by two mat matrix I, I, um, I alluded to, uh, because that's about fiat or non fiat, digital or SWIFT, or, or blockchain or SWIFT or traditional, not necessarily SWIFT, SWIFT is just a messaging system. Centralized or decentralized is a better term to describe the payment technology, okay? Then the third issue is even within fiat currency, is it all issued by a single country or a group of country like Euro? So that will add one more dimension. It's a three, three dimensional problem that I can, my brain cannot calculate. <laughs> calibrate, you know, the possibility. But BRICS idea is to replace an individual country issue currency as a global dominance currency. Many countries attempted to do that. Japan want to push for yen internationalization too in the 80s or 90s, when Honda and Toyota and Sony are trading everywhere in Asia and the US.
Absolutely. I think that the two are closely related. The reason we continue to use dollar, the reason we are so obsessed with dollar and also uh, happy with the current payment system is because it works well for many don't care about whether it's a T plus one or T plus two. For a blockchain, a permission looks, you know, system of blockchain can be real time, very efficient. Because without the intermediary or the, cent or the, cent or the centralized regime or the banking regime, that uh, it takes, it could take even many seconds, you know, to uh, pass through the payment. So, but the, the people are still using the US dollar because people are happy with this, with the current system. And uh, that's why the two, even though they are, I talk about this two by two mat matrix, but they are closely related um, because there's the people behavior and the practice of the financial system. The third issue, the third dimension is who issued it. Do you believe in the US dollar? Do you believe in RMB? Do you believe in Hong Kong dollar? You know, or do you believe in BRICS as a reserve currency? That's a choices, you know, for the world. So some countries, like not necessarily country, what's the, the reserve currency for Macau? Hong Kong dollar. So the Macau central banks or monetary authority of Macau is actually using Hong Kong dollar as a reserve currency, so not US dollar. No, of course you may think that well, Hong Kong dollars reserve <laughs> is US dollar too. But ultimately some countries are, some African countries using Euro as a reserve currency. So this is more a geopolitical consideration, less about the payment system or the payment platform, less about the technology, less about whether they believe in um, fiat or non-fiat currency. It's um, history or legacy. Thank you very much. Um, actually, whatever is going to happen in the next decade is going to be a very interesting ride. Um, so really, or it's going to be very fascinating. So thank you very much, Raymond. I know you have a flight to catch yeah. um, straight to Vietnam. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much for um, this, um, the lunch today as well. So everyone uh, enjoy your rest of the lunch. And yep. Thank you so much, thank everyone. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.